Welcome back. I hope that you had an opportunity to continue the conversation that we started, and I want to thank Pat for um, inspiring some great ideas and, and hopefully takeaways that um, you'll be able to use when you get back to your offices. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Damian Atkins. Damian is the General Counsel of Panasonic North America, and we're very honored to have him here to moderate our next panel. After asking all of you to come up with ideas and solutions, we're now going to let you hear from the experts and hopefully add to your toolbox of, of ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm excited to have this great panel of experts here today. Let me do a really quick brief introduction. We'll hit a few questions and hopefully save some time for questions from the audience, if that makes sense. Uh, here immediately to my left, we have Nimish Patel. He's the Executive Director for Diversity and Inclusion at the Department of Homeland Security, Office of Human Capital. Got that right, right? right. <laughs> it's a mouthful. All right. Next, we have Rohini Anand, Senior Vice President for Corporate Responsibility and the Global Chief Diversity Officer at EXO. Thank you very much. And last but definitely not least, we have Eric Iris Brown, the Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion at Bloomberg. Thank you, thank you very much. So, look, I know we, only, we don't have a lot of time, but I do want to get a chance to really kind of have folks get the benefit of your expertise and experience. Um, you know, one of the challenges that I faced as really a new general counsel in a new organization that hadn't had a lot of turnover for a long time was looking around and going to my CEO and said, look, you know, we, we really need to make some changes here. Um, we have a lot of long-term employees who've been with the company for a long time. And I sit there, you know, the night before the meeting, I mean, I sat there all night struggling, what am I going to say and how am I going to say it? You know, we really need a diversity and inclusion, some kind of effort here at the company. Um, so I want to look to you all. I mean, you know, what is the best way to make the business case for diversity and inclusion? Maybe start off with you, Rahini, and I hear from everyone sure. else on that. So great. Um, thank you, and I'm delighted to be on this panel. We've had some good conversations prior to this, uh, to today, so I'm looking forward to engaging with all of you. So I think, you know, it, I think clearly this is not just a nice to have, and I think we've heard it pretty much all afternoon today, but it has to be linked to the basic business case. It has to be linked to how you do business. And, you know, there were plenty of studies that were cited from Catalyst, and there are others from McKinsey and Credit Suisse that make the correlation between diversity in the C-suite, diversity in the executive ranks, and bottom line results. And for us at Sodexo, it is about the best talent because we need the best talent to grow our business. So it's about <coughs> getting and retaining the best talent. It's about creating an inclusive workplace so that best talent can engage and produce innovative solutions for our clients because we're also a client-facing organization. And it's about a differentiation. So for us, it's a, diversity and inclusion has become a competitive advantage. Our thought leadership in diversity and inclusion is something that gives us access to clients. And the reason I'm here today is because Bloomberg BNA is a client of ours. We were asked to come and present and share best practices with Bloomberg BNA. And, uh, you know, and, and we, weren't asked, we weren't invited in because of our food service business or our facilities management <laughs> business, but we were asked because of our thought leadership in diversity and inclusion. And that provides us another sort of connection to the client organization. It provides us access to clients, and it becomes a client retention vehicle as well. But I'll add one more thing in terms of making the case. So, you know, I've used all of this data and cited different studies to our executives, and we're a global company. We're in 85 countries, 430,000 employees, 36,000 locations, and just today we touched 75 million customers. So it's a huge company, very geographically dispersed. And so I was struggling with making a business case, particularly with our global organization. And one of the things that we commissioned, what we actually did internally, was a study where we looked at gender balance teams and financial performance. And the reason we looked just at gender balance teams is because gender is the one metric that we can actually, one dimension that we can actually measure, dimension of diversity that we can actually measure globally. And um, so what we found was really impressive. What we found was that gender balanced teams, first of all, the sweet spot was 40 to 60% women. And we looked at data from over 100 different entities, 53,000 managers, Sodexo managers, and we correlated gender balanced teams to our KPIs, to our key performance indicators, which were client retention, engagement, brand awareness, and then financial performance. 
And what we found was that teams with 40 to 60 percent women outperformed on every single one of those KPIs. Three percentage points higher in engagement, five percentage points higher in brand awareness, 12 percentage points higher in client retention, 13 percentage points higher in organic growth, and 23 percentage points higher in gross profit. So clearly, you know, that business case is, is hard to, um, to argue with. I mean, this is, it's not about a nice to have, it's not about, you know, it's not, we know that we're all, we're all advocates of social justice, but it, at the end of the day, it's about the business. It's about being better at the business. And that is something that, you know, our managers globally, it resonated, mm -hmm. that study resonated with our managers globally, and we were able to kind of, you know, get their attention and get their commitment and engagement. And I'll just close with, you know, the fact that this study is a little different for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, people talk about balance, but no one really sort of has necessarily quantified what that gender balance, that sweet spot means. For us, it was 40 to 60%. Yeah. We also looked at financial and non-financial indicators. I mean, if you perform well on brand awareness, client engagement, retention, you're going to have better performance. So we looked at both. Um, and then, you know, I mean, I think that uh, both those things together really did. Uh, and, and then the last piece is we looked at management and not just at the C-suite, because for us, the issue is the challenge is the pipeline. We have good diversity in our board. We have 40% women on our board. We have 43% women on our global executive committee, 31% women in our senior executive ranks of top 300. So this is an area that we needed to focus on, and, and the, uh, the pipeline is where we did this study. Eric, anything to add there? There's not a lot to add. You know, I think uh, Rohini really laid it out, and I think what's important is that you're sharing this with your leaders, right? Because we can sit up here and spew all those statistics, but what do your business leaders know? So if they haven't read the McKinsey report, if they haven't read the Catalyst reports, the NC WIT reports, depending on your industry, you know, there are different reports that make that business case and provide the data you know, to influence leaders around diversity and inclusion. At Bloomberg, we're a data-driven company, right? So the data really helps to influence. I think the only thing that I would go into a little more depth on, you know, we have sort of three key things that our leaders have bought into. It's around attracting, you know, recruiting and retaining top talent. Like almost half of our workforce are millennial, millennials. Millennials expect diversity. And even if you think about retention of top talent through the firm, when you think about replacement costs and the economic benefits of retention, that's also part of, of, of platform that any business leader, no matter what industry, can, can really relate to. So it's that talent piece. It is that you know business performance, creativity, and innovation, the discourse, the decision-making processes, things of that nature that, again, as a tech company, right, is really important. And then it's the client piece. And you know, for me, uh, as a former investment banker, even making that real that commercial case, right? You know, BNA, this is our business. You are our clients, and and this is part of how we do business, right? And I think that's also important. We have terminal sales that have been driven through diversity. We have conferences and live events that have been driven through diversity. So really, when you talk about what is that? economic bottom line impact from a commercial standpoint as well can be very powerful. Nimish, anything? Yeah, and I definitely agree with all the comments that have been made so far. Um, for us, you know, we refer to it as, as the mission case for diversity and inclusion. Um, and it's been absolutely essential in, in building that across the department. And let me just give you a little bit of context to understand the department. Um, it's a really fascinating place because it's technically only 13 years old, which is fairly young, especially when it comes to federal agencies, and you think about how it was created. So, you know, most of us have looked at mergers and acquisitions in the private side. You take two companies, even that's complex to make that successful. But you think about the department's history where you have some agencies that are over 100 years old, like Coast Guard and Secret Service. You have others that were brand new after 9-11, like TSA, and others that were created from other agencies, like Citizenship and Immigration Services. And then take all of those and you slap a department on top of all of that. That's Homeland Security. So the, the challenges that we have in terms of even just managing a department like that is really um, pretty amazing. And then you think about it's 230,000 employees globally. Um, so getting the entire department to move in the same direction on any issue is a challenge in and of itself. 
Uh, but I think we're, one of the areas where we've had a lot of success is actually in diversity and inclusion. And a large part of that comes down to the idea of how we were able to establish the mission case for diversity and inclusion. And we really do it by focusing on the different mission spaces that we have across the department. So we, we, go, we talk to FEMA and we talk about what happened with Hurricane Katrina. I mean, you know, you're talking about a situation where people are at their most desperate hour. They, uh, they could have lost family members, they, they've lost their homes, and now they're trying to rebuild. But we've got to make sure that we're able to engage with community members where they are, that we're able to identify them, and that we're also able to come up with creative solutions in a very fast-paced environment. So that's one example, but the same happens all across all our, our different components. So we really try to underscore that exactly as, as Erica and Rohina were saying, this is not just a feel good, do the right thing, even just to reflect the diversity of our country. All of those are great things, but at the end of the day, this is about how we can more effectively accomplish our mission. Um, and that's something that's really resonated with all of our folks and, and, and even with our employees when we talk about it, it's something that they definitely embrace. Um, and it's, it's definitely, when we've asked or kind of polled our employees, what are some of the most important things you see in the department? Diversity is definitely one of the things that comes up uh, at the top. Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, it, it, now that we've got this good sense of how to make the business case, you know, the saying goes, you only manage what you measure, right? And how do you go about you know, measuring results and progress in diversity and inclusion efforts? And, actually, and then you can actually make folks and hold folks accountable to it. Uh, what are some of the best practices, tools that you learned, tools that you've used? Erica, maybe hear from you, and I'd like to hear from everyone else, too. Sure. So the way that we've approached it, we haven't imposed goals on our business leaders, but rather had them set their own goals. So every business leader, including David, has a diversity and inclusion business plan. And it's a plan that they've set that focuses on recruit, retain, develop, and also gives uh, each business leader the opportunity to come up with you know, a big idea, something that's unique to their business that they want to try, pilot, um, you know, and be creative around solving for DNI, right? We all know there's no magic bullet, but what might move the needle from a very creative standpoint? And, uh, and they set their goals in those, around those initiatives. And, and the accountability is to our chairman. So every six months, the business leader and their diversity champion is reporting out to the chairman around the progress that's been made. So, you know, I think part of the philosophy is that our business leaders lead from the front, that they own it, that it's not imposed, and that the goals that they set are, they're meant to be ambitious, aspirational, um, you know, and, and, and driven by the specific business. And we have very different businesses, right? So, you know, we're in the technology space, we're in the media space, you know, we're in the financial services space. So, you know, there's not a one size fits all solution. And by having our leaders lead from the front, we feel like then, you know, you have the diversity and inclusion team that can be provide that subject matter expertise and support those efforts. So, you know, so we, as an HR organization, measure lots of things, right? So, you know, we are looking at representation, we are looking at career progressions, we are looking at attrition, we are looking at reasons for leaving, we are looking at employee engagement surveys, and we're slicing and dicing that data by race, gender, tenure at the company, et cetera. So there's lots of metrics that you can measure and look for trends and, and look for, you know, opportunities to address potential disparities. But I think overall, when you think about the goals uh, you know, we felt really good about having the business leaders set them for themselves and create initiatives that they will have skin in the game and drive as leaders, and then we support. Absolutely. Anything to add? You I, yeah, I, so we've taken a different approach um, at Sodexo. So at Sodexo, you know, the challenge for us was we wanted to get the executive buy-in, but we really wanted that accountability to get cascaded throughout the organization. So this is, you know, North America specific, we actually have a diversity scorecard. And the scorecard has qualitative and quantitative components. So it has quantitative components around recruiting, retention, promotion of women and minorities. And the qualitative components are the ones that are actually identified by the leadership. So we work in concert with our business units and they identify which, which quantitative, be qualitative behavior change elements need to get measured. Um, this is rolled up into a point scoring system, and incentive compensation is actually linked to the scorecard. So we have 10 to 15% uh, of our manager's bonuses linked to the scorecard, 
It used to be that we had 25% of our executive team's bonus, it's now 15%. But the most significant thing is that this bonus is decoupled from the financial performance of the company, which is a huge commitment from the executive committee. And what that means is even if financially the company does not do well one particular year, we still pay out that bonus because, and the reason for that is, you know, we're in it for the long haul. We can't stop, start these efforts based on how a company does financially. So we really have made this a significant um, in, initiative for us, a significant commitment on the part of the executive team. And globally, we've taken a bit of a different approach, very similar to what you shared uh, with Bloomberg. We really, you know, there we have sort of diversity plans that, are, that the CEO um, reviews with his executive committee. But just recently we had a meeting and one of the executives came up with this idea, which I have not heard so far, but I think we're going to implement it, which is that 10% of the executive committee's shares would be linked to a long-term objective around diversity and inclusion. I, and I didn't suggest it, they did, which was great. <laughs> wow, there wasn't a riot or anything? <laughs> <laughs> they have to convince each other, yeah, they have yeah. to fight it out, but I, you know, I think it was a... A brilliant idea. So let's see. We, you know, if we implement it, it would be cool. But you know, to me, I think the important thing is, however you do it, the accountability is critical. So at a business unit level, we have the scorecard. At an individual level, each manager's performance review has a diversity uh, competency to it. So they're reviewed on their individual diversity competence, which is linked to their you know merit increase and and then. You know, the business unit has a scorecard. So that's, that's interesting. So we have financial incentives, uh, we have scorecards, but in the public sector where you sit, I mean, it's a different environment. So how does that, how does that play out for you? It is. So it's kind of interesting to hear this. So we, we all take, there's some commonalities in all of our approaches, and there's going to be some differences in all of our approaches as well. So, um, so we definitely use uh, both scorecards and dashboards. Uh, so for us, the dashboard is, uh, is, is a very high-level overview of some of the key metrics so that you, you can imagine for Secretary Johnson, if he's going from managing so many different areas that are hot at any given moment, when we've got a chance to sit down with him and focus on diversity and inclusion, we want him to know exactly where the strengths are for the department in different areas, where some of the challenges are, and that can naturally lead to, all right, here's where we need you to focus, and here's where we could really use your help in helping push the message or having follow-up conversations with component heads or whatever it might be. So, so the dashboard is really meant for that purpose, but then we also have, um, we have a lot of external stakeholders as well. <laughs> we have a lot of friends uh, on the Hill who have an interest in what we're doing in terms of diversity and inclusion. So <laughs> the dashboard also helps with conveying our, our message with some of those other key stakeholders as well. So we use the dashboard for that purpose. Then we also have scorecards that um, are used more for our component heads and our diversity lead, diversity inclusion leaders and all of our different components. So that way, they have a much better idea of what are the, the specifics that are going on in each one of our components. And part of what the, the value of the dashboard, the accountability piece, for us, we can't tie it into, um, into our sure. bonuses yeah. and stuff like that. Um, but what we do is in the dashboard, we break out all of our big components and again, on some of our key diversity inclusion metrics. And so the, the, the accountability, so to speak, comes more from the pressure or the, the peer pressure of not wanting to be the one who's really off from your peers. <laughs> and so that actually works out pretty well for us. Um, that there, you know, everyone at that level is, um, is, is competitive in a good way. Um, and so when they see uh, how others are, are performing, we, we certainly understand that there's going to be different needs across our, our organization. But again, no one wants to be the clear outlier. And so that kind of refocuses their attention if necessary. Um, and that's actually worked out pretty well for us. The only area that we actually set um, department-wide goals is, uh, is in veterans hiring. Um, and that's, that's more of a, a focus. It's coming from the president. Um, and, you know, what, and, and I think a lot of you are probably focused on some of these issues as well. You know, the Department of Defense is projecting about 200 to 300,000 service members returning home every year for the next several years. So I think for all of us across the country, making sure that we're taking care of our veterans who've given so much is such a high priority. So that is a department-wide goal, and it's actually a federal government-wide goal. 
Um, and, and that's an area that we're certainly looking for federal partner, I mean, uh, private sector partners mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Well, let me you drill know, down a little bit. jump in oh, and sure, just mention ahead. one thing that's, sure. that's worth mentioning, especially since, um, you know, I know Sodexo is very global. We're in 192 com uh, countries ourselves, is that there are certain <coughs> countries that do have certain goals yeah. and quotas set for you, right? So uh, certainly we respect and try to achieve those goals as well, like, for example, in, in, in Japan for people with dis different abilities. So, so you know, it's not that everything is set in-house, right? And when you think about it from a global landscape, yeah. you also have to think about what the implications are by country. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to put a pin on the diversity inclusion in a global environment. I mean, I work at a Japanese company, and diversity inclusion efforts there are well, somewhat different than it was when I was at AOL. <laughs> um, but I want to put a pin in that. And I just want to drill down a little bit on the, on the stats and KPIs. <laughs> If you were to choose maybe a top three stats that really move the needle in the area, what would they be? Anyone better than the others? Because I'd like, you know, I'm going to put my CEO hat on, right? Great, we're talking stats and numbers, but give me the two or three that are really kind of critical to, to ensuring progress. And I'm just going to throw that out there, jump ball. I'm not sure. So what do you mean so by is it, stats? So for too? example, a, a, key, a, a, key, a key stat would be 40% women on a team outperform uh -huh. others. I see. Okay. So if you talk to a CEO and you say, look, if you get the 40% number, you're going to see tangible benefits of performance there. So are there any other kind of stats or metrics that are probably the best ones to ensure performance? You know, for us, based on the study that we did with our internal data, it would be 40 to 60% women mm -hmm. on teams of 40 to 60% mm -hmm. diversity. What's interesting is that when we looked at the study, when you get over 60% women, the results start plateauing. And that's um, very interesting because, I mean, this is not about you know, one group that's better than the other. It really is about that creativity, that you know, diverse perspectives that get to better outcomes. So for us, if we were to look internally, that would be the stat that would be uh, most compelling. Yes, yeah, CEOs are always looking for that magic bullet. Yeah, right. What's that, what is that one or two things that I can measure and manage yeah. against? Any other? I don't have a magic stat, you know, but I think, you know, overall when you're looking at your numbers, right, and you think about what you want to achieve, right, you have to be thoughtful at how you're looking at the whole picture, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, how are you hiring, mm -hmm. right? What does the attrition look like, you know, and, and how are those rates vary? You know, what's the pull through? What does the recruiting funnel look like, right? Because then I think you also can, you know, I think people make a lot of assumptions when it comes to diversity. So, oh, they're just not applying. Well, are right. they just not applying or are they just not getting to what yeah. interview stage, right? You know, so I think having the data even when you look at the entire employee life cycle, and how they compete, compare one to another. You know, are we losing women faster than we're losing men? You know, are we hiring at higher rates than current representation? And you know, and, and what's the narrative around some of the you know what, what I consider sort of stats, right? right you know, right. when you think about how you look at your company, that can also be quite informative because sometimes even seeing that narrative, just seeing key numbers, you know, you mean we only hired X percent of X population this year? You know, right. and it, it can be a real eye-opener for leaders that don't always look at, you know, the diversity numbers in that way, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, so that's, that's the only thing I could offer in terms of that question. No, I think that's, I think that's great. I mean, it's the mosaic theory, right? It's not, it's not the silver bullet. There's not one silver bullet that's going to solve all your problems. It's the mosaic. It's the picture that's, it's the picture that's set from all the various data points that point you in the right direction. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I, I don't know if we have a, a magic step, but the, the one that uh, certainly gets uh, a lot of attention, whether it's from the secretary or some of our other senior leaders, is definitely what we call the, uh, the senior executive service, the SES. So that's the top 0.4% of, of the federal workforce. Um, and so for us, it's about 700 people. Um, but that is, th those are the folks who are the most senior leaders across the organization who have the greatest influence in their respective organizations. So that's the one that gets a lot of focus and attention to see how diversity is among that group. Um, and in, in, in part because we also take a, then look at the pipeline that's, that's leading up to them. Um, the, other, the other one that I think gets a lot of attention right now, and um, I think Erica, you mentioned this earlier, is millennials. Um, you know, we've got a lot of focus on that 
there's a, you know, in some of our positions, especially the law enforcement positions, there's mandatory retirements. So you have different things that are driving the interest there. But the other part that comes up with millennials is um, just mo more, you know, the, the younger generations in general tend to move around more. Gen X moves around a lot more than the boomers. But millennials are even statistically moving around even more than the Gen Xers. So that is, uh, that, that's definitely an area of focus because not only do we need to get them in the door, but then the retention piece becomes really, really important as well. So those are probably the, the two biggest things that a lot of our folks are focused on. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. Turning back to the global environment, though, um, you know, I'd say, you know, in Panasonic, diversity and inclusion really means having non-Japanese management mm -hmm. globally, <laughs> right? Uh, and women. That's true. And it's, it's interesting seeing how that's played out on a global basis. Uh, what does that really mean for, for you all's operations? And again, I'll throw this out as a jump ball. Well, I think for us, you know, again, operating in 192 countries, you know, we do have uh, multiple dimensions of diversity that we focus on globally. And uh, there are some that are universal. Rohini mentioned gender is, you know, a global statistics that we, statistic that we track. Um, very closely. We look at disability globally. We look at LGBT globally. So there are a lot of dimensions that do cut across uh, the globe. I think even <clears throat> when you think about different dimensions of people of color, whether or not we're looking at Afro-Brazilians in, in, in Brazil or African-Americans here or Afro-Caribbean and black and, you know, in, in EMEA, um, you know, I think you have these different measurements and categories and they can roll up to some super categories and even one of our initiatives is really starting to collect ethnic data globally because that is not something that we currently do. So uh, we do collect gender, we will be collecting ethnic data, we will be collecting LGBT. There are some countries that you know you have yeah, to carve France? out. Is that hard to do in um, France or someplace? Yeah, so, yeah France, Germany. Yeah. Yeah. There are a couple yeah. of carve out um, countries, but for us, we can capture you know eighty five percent of our population uh, for different categories, sixty percent for disability. So it depends on what we're talking about. But we've gone through great pains to figure out legally what we can collect because you know, again, when you talk about measurement, and you talk about understanding your populations, and you talk about setting goals, mm -hmm. you need to know what your baseline is. Oh, absolutely. So just to, to build on that, I think you know, we take a similar approach. It's very contextual. It depends on the country, the laws of the country. So Rexo is, has a French parent company. And <laughs> the understanding of diversity and inclusion in Europe and in France in particular is very different from the United States. So, you know, first of all, you can't legally collect any data, any demographic data in terms of, you know, race, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, et cetera. So that really puts a, a ringer on, on what you can do. But I think the other piece there is, and this was, a, you know, a challenge that I, I really sort of was an uphill battle for me because, you know, anything related to diversity and inclusion was perceived as an American export. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I had to really you know, fight against because I had to be very sensitive, very careful that this was, you know, I wasn't take, using a US lens, knowing full well that we had gone through the journey in this country, <coughs> that there were lessons that were transferable, et cetera, et cetera, but had to position it very carefully outside of the United States, particularly in Europe and particularly in France. So you know uh, that was that was quite an <laughs> quite a hurdle to overcome. But I, but I think like Panasonic, we too look at um, non-French in our executive ranks because that's absolutely critical. Um, and we're beginning to do uh, work on uh, uh, disabilities, LGBT. The one area where I, you know I just don't know any company that's done particularly significant work is around uh, minorities because I think that's, you know, it has, you know, different connotations and dif in different regions and different countries. It has to be very contextualized. Uh, but I, th I think we just have to do more in that space than, than any of us has done. You know, we, we're looking at it in Brazil, but there's still a lot more, you know, that we can and should be doing across the board with, with corporations in general. So. Yeah, and South Africa has, yeah. you know, the EEA plans. Right. And, and so, you know, again, by country, there are nuances and opportunities to address even ethnic diversity, but it's certainly the most challenging. And I think race also is just yeah. the most difficult thing 
that when you come to talking about race, people get very uncomfortable. And that's probably a global theme, no matter, including here in the U.S., in yeah. my opinion. And, you know, it's really interesting for, for DHS. We're, we're de- this is one area where we're definitely different because when we have our folks, most of our workforce is still in the United right. States, but we do have people all over the world. But at, at the end of the day, they're still held by U.S. laws um, and our federal regulations and stuff like that. So, so for us, that one is a little bit different. But where it comes up is uh, we have engagements with other countries. So... Uh, not too long ago, the German Marshall Fund had a meeting uh, mm-hmm. with all the NATO allies, and they were bringing in, they were looking at diversity and inclusion for the armed services. So we were there with the, the U.S. Coast Guard, and it's fascinating. So even in Europe, they're, they're, especially for their armed services, they're looking at the diversity of their armed services, how they can ensure that they've got a cohesive work force, um, how they can more effectively accomplish their missions. So some of the things that we talked about, for example, if you remember the University of Michigan case, um, Quite a few years ago, one of the uh, the amicus briefs was filed by retired flag officers, and they were talking about the importance of diversity, but also inclusion. It wasn't really used back then that term, but really it was about diversity and inclusion between the officers and the enlisted, and how if you don't have that, there can be a breakdown in communication, and how that can impact the mission overall. And so it was fascinating that even our allies are now facing some of these same issues because. Europe is becoming more and more diverse, and so you've got, even in the armed services, people from all over the world who have come to Europe and are now serving in, those, uh, in their armed forces, and now they're actually looking to the United States for some guidance um, and how we've managed um, uh, that, that particular issue over the years. So it's, it's kind of fascinating. The only other thing I'd mention as an American and a very New York-based company is um, you know, the issue of local leadership. So when you look outside of the U.S. and you think about, you know, who's running the office, who's leading sales, et cetera, to ensure that there is a strong pipeline of local leaders, especially like in Asia and certain countries. So I think that's a big issue that a lot of global chief diversity officers are looking at. Mm-hmm. How do you really create that pipeline of local leadership mm. in, in, you know, other countries? How do you deal with, um, you know, like Panasonic, we have a lot of expats who come from Japan mm-hmm. who then mon- manage business operations in the U.S. And, you know, speaking bluntly, you know, there's a lot of cultural differences in how you d- deal with employees and conflict yeah. and whatnot. So we have, you know, pretty intensive training. It's like these are the norms here, these are things you can do. Do you do the similar things with in your, in your organization? Yeah, I think we sort of learned the hard way. <laughs> right. And so now, you know, within the first couple of weeks that they're in the United States, for instance, we, they do go through training, some you know, basic EO kinds of things, questions you can and cannot ask. You know, in an interview, you, know, you can't ask a person their age and you can't ask them how many kids they have. I mean, just basic things. Because I think, you know, I've sat in meetings you know, in other countries where when you introduce yourself, the first thing you say is, I'm so and so. This is my age. This is how many kids I have. Right. You know, and exactly. it's just right. part of the sort of norm in the in the whole introduction process. So we definitely do put them through um, through training, and it's the same thing with you know Americans going Absolutely. to other parts of the world because there Absolutely. again, um, you know, going to the Middle East, we've had some experiences there where we you know, of course, corrected and made sure that we our folks get trained in the first couple of weeks. This is one I'll, I'll give an example from when I was in private practice um, and why this is so important. Um, we were working with, uh, with a client that um, had, a, had a major focus here in the United States. Um, a big part of their, their marketing strategy was outreach to, to women in particular. And one of their, their high profile executives from another country was involved in, um, in a pretty visible uh, gender discrimination, harassment type of situation. Um, and so one of the things that we certainly did through that process is help develop kind of basically a, a training program because, you know, the, the reality is there are different norms in different countries, but people have, it's, it's helpful for them to know what the expectations are here because you really don't want to run yeah. into that situation um, where it can have a lot of negative um, impact on the, the brand that you're so carefully trying to build and, and nurture um, that can be damaged by a high profile yeah. incident like that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, maybe I'll turn this last question and I'll turn it over to questions for, from the audience. Um, you know, I think we've all, particularly everyone in here, has, has a demonstrated commitment to diversity and inclusion uh, as, a, as an organizing principle or as a, a, business, a strategic business imperative. Um, but oftentimes, as the organization will make that commitment, 
there then becomes a gap between a sustained personal investment by senior leadership and the development of diverse employees, whether it's pipeline issues or otherwise. How do we bridge that gap? Is it a motivation? Is it, is it a different pathways to like making a commitment to diversity and inclusion in the abstract versus a sustained personal investment, whether it's mentorship or a sponsorship, those kinds of things? You volunteered for this question. We spoke earlier, so I'm going to lead off with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, at the end of the day, it, it is all yeah. about trying to make that personal connection for, for everyone, um, and, and definitely for our most senior leaders, but really for, for people across the, uh, across the organization. I mean, a big part of what we try to do is, is it kind of goes back to the, a little bit of the mission case, but trying to bring it back down to a personal level. Why is this important to you? Why should you care about this at the end of the day? Um, and we found that, that, that that's a really helpful tool. The other thing that I think has been really fascinating, we've used this in some of our, our trainings, there's the, um, it kind of gets to another thing that we had talked about in general, which, which is unconscious <laughs> bias. There's the Harvard implicit bias test. Um, and most people are people of goodwill. So most of us think that you know, we're generally pretty open-minded people. So when you take a test like that, it, it shows where you are and, and also relative to everyone else who's taken it. So it, it's a really effective tool of just kind of opening people's minds and, and eyes. And for us, that's been a really interesting tool to help people say, you know, there's more that I can do on a personal level. There's more that I'm invested in doing, not just for the sake of the organization, the mission, that's, that's clearly the driver, but even on a personal level, there's something that I think I can, I can do um, to further these efforts. And so for us, it, you know, one of the most effective ways of trying to make it more personal has been some of those kinds of strategies. Um, and one of the things that we also tell folks is, um, and we, again, we kind of relate back to them for the most senior leaders, you know, think about yourself over the course of your career. For most people at the most senior levels, there was someone who looked out for them at some point or another. Uh, who either created opportunities for them, opened doors for them, made introductions, kind of gave them a stretch project to, to really bring, bring more attention to their abilities. So those are the kinds of things that helped most people at some point in their career. So how are you then turning around and helping someone else? And if you can do that for someone who doesn't just remind you of you 20 years ago, uh, but you know, in general, then that can be really effective. And so that, for us, has been something that's definitely worked. Yeah, I would say it's also a challenge to folks in the audience that, particularly as you're developing in your career, if you're a diverse, you know, diverse employee, you cannot be a mystery to people that you're working with. Um, I find that often is a huge obstacle. Um, you know, people have to get to know you, and people will connect with you based on whether or not they they like something about you, and it could be any number of different things: kids, sports, books, movies, TV, something. And too often I find that folks are afraid to show them to be their authentic, true selves in a work environment, but people are not going to make a connection with you or invest in you if they don't necessarily feel that there's something about you that is similar. You're working in the same environment. You practice law, obviously. There's something there. Um, so it's, it's in somewhat incumbent upon you to be to get in kind of the like zone, I call it. Um, you know, those are my, just, just my thoughts. It's a two-way street. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, um, I think... Um, Senior leaders have to role model certain behavior and lead from the fr front in terms of uh, being open to those relationships. And I think that you know, individual diverse individuals have to seize those opportunities and be open to having that dialogue. You know, I think it's as simple as uh, you know. I think if you asked a lot of senior leaders, have you ever even had you know a cup of coffee or dinner with somebody of difference? You know, and talked about what it's like to be a difference at your company. You know, I, I don't think that happens that often. I don't think people have person when people say, I don't know where to find the talent. Well, who, who's in your personal circle even, or who are your go-to people? It's probably not a diverse group. You know, to even know somebody, to even have a conversation, to understand what the experience of an African American woman might be working at Bloomberg. You know, so I think some of those lines have to, of communication have to be open. And, and, and people have to be willing to be authentic on both sides. And those are challenging conversations to have. They're uncomfortable. It's awkward. But, you know, there really isn't that open communication very often. I, I would just add to that. I think at the end of the day, you know, you can have the best laid scorecards and 
incentive compensations, but it really comes down to that personal mm -hmm. conviction. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think mentoring and sponsorship has happened organically in every organization. It's just that women and minorities have not necessarily been at the receiving end of sponsorship. So I think what we try and do is to put initiatives in place that allow for that to happen. And I'll just give you know, a quick example. Our previous CEO who retired, um, he, Dick Macedonia, he said that he worked at Sodexo for 30 years and really he never had a female supervisor and uh, you know, very limited interactions with people of color. And through the initiative that we had, he actually mentored a district manager in the company who was an African-American male. And that basically changed his life. I mean, he said that I had never, you know, I just could not understand, uh, you know, could never have understood the kinds of experiences that this man had. And he said, I will not allow that to happen within my organization. So I think it's being creative and coming up with ways and really understanding your leadership and then, you know, figuring out what's going to influence them to move the needle. And just another quick story that comes to my mind is in Europe, we had a senior executive who was who really didn't you know buy into the initiative. He was a more a check the box kind of person, and um, and so we got him involved in an external mentoring initiative. And he mentored a woman from a different company who lost her job. And for the first time, he kind of he came to me and he said, you know, I just I cannot believe that women go through what she went through. And I want to make sure that every member of my executive team uh, is mentoring someone, uh, mentoring a woman from a different country. So I think it's these sort of you know, personal experiences, epiphanies, whatever you call them. In addition, so there's no one size fits all. There's no one solution. It's, you know, it's the incentives. It's the accountability. It's the metrics. It's, it's all of those things, including the personal experiences that we provide because people are not ill-intentioned. It's just you know, giving them the awareness and the education so that they can be open to experiences that are different from theirs. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, it's interesting. I find that you know, one of the challenges is the decision pathway for a senior leader to build and develop a personal commitment or sustained commitment to someone's success is very different than a commitment to diversity, right? So. You know, for me, for example, you know, I'm very busy, and to have a, you know, I've led various, you know, various challenges and resources, time, attention, whatever else. So, folks have to. I mean, it's really mm -hmm. as as you progress in your career, you have to figure out ways to convince okay. someone to invest those resources in you, and whether or not is, you know, staying around corners for that person, you know, complimenting someone's weakness, I mean, being a strength somewhere where someone's strong, uh, weak. Uh, those are the kind of things that are incumbent on us. It is definitely a two-way street. I want to open it up for questions now. We have just a few minutes. Uh, don't be shy. You're not shy. <laughs> <laughs> so I started talking about the business case for diversity, and I, and I hear this discussion a lot, but it seems that there's a gap missing <clears throat> because oftentimes the case is discussed in terms of our profitability increased, mm -hmm. higher sales, those sorts of things. Uh, it, when, when Paulette was talking about having nine pitchers, it's an easy metric to measure if you lose the ball game, right? But our legal profession, our fundamental service, is not measurable in that way. And so, you know, what is, from a law firm's perspective, you know, how do you measure your success? Profitability, the most sophisticated cases, highest profile cases. Those are not changed by diversity at this point. And so we wonder why hasn't there been change? Change would happen if you saw firms being more profitable that are being more diverse, firms getting higher profile cases, you know, having more sophisticated cases if they're diverse. From a client's perspective, the client or the, the individual at the client who's trying to uh, move the needle within their, in, within their organization about diversity by saying we need to hire diverse firms, well, what do they have to measure? it? They can't go to their CEO or their president and say, we need to hire this firm because they will get us a better deal in this merger, or they will win this case more than another firm will. We, we don't have those metrics for someone to point to, to say, this is why diversity matters. And so it, it, we, we move away from 
let's not talk about it being just the moral thing to do, but there's this business case. But I don't know how we make the business case in our current environment when what we do just doesn't lend itself. Now, I'm a trial lawyer, so I can make the case that a more diverse trial team is going to be much better for me yeah. when I get to a jury. Well, that's, that's still hard to quantify to say, and if you look at 100 jury trials, the more diverse trial team won because you have so many intangibles with facts, the law, so many things come into play. But, you know, that's, that's a, a, I think you can have a bigger discussion around that, but in terms of, you know, you're a tax lawyer or you're doing a real estate closing, mean, it's, it's hard to explain why diversity is creating a better product, which to me is where you really make the business case is it's a better product, it's making the firm more profitable, which is, you know, why, why you're in it for the money or you know, high, high profile cases. And so that's, that's where I struggle. And when I hear these discussions, it seems that that piece is always missing is to apply that business case to the reality of what the legal profession is. I, I'll just speak from, you know, I think I don't know law firms intimately, so I'm speaking from a corporate perspective, but I will say that our general counsel does require the law firms that we work with to be diverse. So whether it's teams of diverse lawyers working on a particular uh, case for us, or it's you know partner diversity in the law firm. That that's a requirement. So that's well, my one. My question would uh -huh. be, why does he require it though? Is he requiring because it gets him better results, or is he requiring because he thinks it's the right thing to do? I think it's both. But he obviously does truly believe that it gets him better results. Otherwise, he wouldn't be compromising one for the other. I mean, he he does believe that this is, and you know, I mean, whether it's a uh, you know. I think it's partly because he's internalized the business case at Sodexo. He believes that you get a better output. There's you know, plenty of other data that shows that you know, diverse teams lead to innovations, et cetera. So that's one. I think the other one is a talent argument. I mean, at the end of the day, you want to hire the best talent. You are, you know, I think we're all depleting a pool of talent unless we go across and hire the best possible talent. My daughter is a lawyer. Um, she is going to have good choices of law firms to work for. She's actually clerking in the Supreme Court. She is very clear that she is not going to work for a law firm where she doesn't see someone like her at the top. I think law firms will miss out on, on some fantastic talent. So I want better business cases there. <laughs> <laughs> so and I, I definitely agree with that. And I think the other thing to, uh, to mention, and Rohini, you mentioned this uh, to, to a point as well, is the, the idea of that diverse teams do lead to innovation. And I think at the end of the day, law firms still need to keep, keep an eye on that as well, because the practice of law is, you know, as we all know, I mean, it's, it's not cookie cutter. Every case is different. Every fact pattern is different. So when you have diverse teams, you're going to be able to see fact patterns and situations from different perspectives, and that can also ultimately drive to to a better result for for the client. So, and, and what's what's interesting, there's been a lot of studies from companies like McKinsey and others, uh, but now there's also a lot of academic research that's also right. supporting this as well. So, for example, Professor Scott Page at the University of Michigan has right. done some really great work in this space. And it's really kind of hard when you see that kind of evidence and you, you, you understand the challenges that he's talking about, where you have complex issues and you have diverse teams, they consistently outperform the homogenous teams. And so it's, you're really seeing this consistently. So I think law firms, even in the unique setting of law firms, which is definitely different than a corporation or a government agency, um, but the same concepts and the same reasons for why diversity matters, that, that it leads to those more innovative solutions, can be helpful ultimately because the clients want those innovative right. solutions. Okay. I mean, I would just challenge all of you in this room to pull your resources and do a study. Well, that's what that I'm show, saying. you know, since you don't have the data, the right? Yeah. That's what's missing. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, it's none of those. It's always let's apply this. It should. Right. If it applies there, it applies here. And I, I completely agree with again. Right. Just because of the nature of what I do, I see it firsthand. Mm -hmm. I, and I had a, a case where uh, it was an employment discrimination lawsuit, and, and I was brought in to try the case with one of my partners. And I looked at some of the things they were doing, and they had checked off. You know, nothing discriminatory had been said. Here are all the statements that had been said, and they had these statements. And one of the statements was, "It was a a, a white man to a black man. I own you." And it was said in a military sense, you're on my team, I own you. 
But my partner didn't realize that this was a racial <laughs> statement. And, and I said, well, whoa. <laughs> I said, you know, that's, no, that just doesn't, right. that, you don't tell a black man I own you. Right. So, right. so I can see it, but I'm saying those studies yeah. Yeah. haven't been done in our profession to go to someone and say, here's why. Yeah. You know, or to go to clients and say, here's why you hire this firm. Yeah. That, that would be a pretty That would be great, thing. actually, yeah. to do that kind of a study. I think I got time for maybe one, maybe two things. And as we're uh, getting the I next think, question, uh, I think the diverse bar associations would love to partner yeah. with law firms on something like that to help build that case. I know, um, uh, you know, I was former president of NAPAVA, the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. These things are something we talk about all the mm -hmm. time. So I think that would be a really interesting thing to do for the legal profession. So. Yeah, actually, unfortunately, I think we are out of time. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, there. So I want, to, I want to thank everyone at the panel for coming up. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you to Damien and all the other panelists. Um, great segue on, on, on data and on some sort of research being brought forward. So Rhonda mentioned earlier that we're partnering with Paul Hastings on a survey. All of you will be getting an email in the near future as we try to dive in on this issue. We pride ourselves around big law business on editorial integrity and being balanced. If we were in Casey Sullivan, who's sitting in the back, would literally rip my arms off my body. However, on this issue, you know, I think everybody agrees the status quo needs to be improved. Uh, so what we're hoping to do is to provide fresh data, a good platform for the dialogue, and then subsequent events where people can get together and come up with more solutions. I want to thank all our speakers. I also want to thank a few people on our team who did a phenomenal job in planning this event and executing it. And that's Sona Pancholi and Annette Robertson from our content team, Betsy Garman and Tracy Gimbel from our event operations team, and Cassandra Whiteside from our Big Low Business commercial team. Um, encourage everybody to come to the site. As I said, you'll be getting an email and a survey. If you haven't signed up for the Big Low Business website newsletter, I'd encourage you to do so. We cover diversity as one of our key topics on a daily basis. Um, and Look forward to seeing all of you, hopefully, at our Big Law Business Summit, our annual summit on June 8th here in the city. Thank you very much again, and we have a reception with drinks.